Well, welcome, Village Church. It is so good to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Fanu, and I get to serve as one of the pastors uh, here at Village. And I want to uh, thank you for joining us today from at all of our locations and online. Uh, so thrilled to be able uh, to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, I get to serve as the regional director for church planting for Village Church in the greater Toronto area, uh, the largest city in our nation. Uh, guys, it's so exciting because over the course of COVID, uh, during this pandemic, you know, a lot of people were like, well, I guess church doesn't work and church planting doesn't work uh, when there's a global pandemic happening. But you know what's interesting? God actually used the pandemic to draw people from right across the greater Toronto area. And now we've got a launch team from Burlington, if you know the greater Toronto area, all the way out to Oshawa. So many families that are committed to seeing gospel-centered village church sites launched in our city. In fact, our launch teams start gathering on Sunday mornings uh, starting on Easter Sunday. So please be praying uh, for us. And if you're watching from the GTA, I want to encourage you, if you want to be a part of a launch team of a gospel-centered church that's going to see people come to know Jesus, see people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus, I want to invite you to join us and be a part of it. And on all of our locations, I want you to be praying for us that God's going to do what only He can do, transform lives. Uh, today we're back in the Gospel of John, and uh, we did a mini-series called This is Village Church. We talked about the mission, we talked about gospel, community, culture, and commitment. And so now we're back in the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 9 and a verse uh, 1 on. I'm going to read a few verses here for you. Here's what it says. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came back seeing. A really um, interesting miracle that Jesus does here. And I love this, this word here where he, Jesus talks about, he, it says he passed by and Jesus saw a blind man. It almost seems to me that uh, this was not a scheduled uh, interaction. It, it seems like Jesus and his disciples were just passing through uh, this particular area and they happened to notice this blind man. And I thought about that for a moment and I said, isn't this how God often works? That uh, many times you just have no idea what he's about to do in your life. It, it seems like this is not something that's going to happen on this particular day, but God had a plan for this man. I, I wonder what he said, what the blind man said to his parents when he was leaving home that morning, because the Bible tells us when you keep reading in this passage of Scripture that he had parents and, and family and all of that. I wonder what he said when he was going out to beg for the morning, like, I'll be back at five, I'll be back, hopefully I'll make something as a blind beggar, and yet this was the day that God had already scheduled, God had already planned for his life to be transformed. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, one of the things we have to get comfortable with is that often you just don't know what the future holds. In many ways, you feel like you're the blind man when it comes to tomorrow. What does tomorrow hold? Where am I going tomorrow? What is my life going to look like in one week, in two weeks, in six weeks, in a year? This is really one of the weaknesses that I have. I like to be in control. I'm the kind of guy that plans everything, even when we're, we're on vacation. I like to have an agenda for every day of the vacation time. So I remember a couple of years ago, my wife and I, we went to California, uh, San Diego, L.A., San Francisco, did the whole, uh, stayed in a couple of weeks, did a bit of a cruise as well. And I still remember in San Francisco, I was so particular that I would see every possible site in San Francisco. And so we dragged this 10-month-old baby, our first child, 10-month-old, 
all through the city all day long. I'm talking about 12 hour days. In fact, I made, she was like, well, let's go back to the hotel so she can t- to have her nap time. I said, no, we don't need to do that. Let's just go back to the parking garage, uh, P3, which is the third underground, and let, the, let, let her sleep in the car for 30 minutes so I can make sure I get everything done. I don't, know, I don't know if you have any control freaks like me and people who are super planned like me, but that's just, listen, during the global pandemic, how many of us waited 15 hours on the phone with Air Canada and WestJet trying to get our money back, come on now, for a trip we planned a year ago and a global pandemic hit and all of a sudden all our plans are gone. That's just the way it is. Often you just don't know what God is doing and, and where God is taking us. And, uh, you know, my story of coming to Village Church is, uh, sort of interesting. It, it's sort of like this. Uh, three years ago, I uh, was running a ministry that I started when I was 19 years old. I ran it for about 18 years, a global uh, evangelistic ministry, and we traveled about 20 plus nations, preached to tens of thousands of people, so saw thousands of people across the world come to know Jesus. And then uh, we were in this phase uh, the last couple of years of just consulting with local churches in the greater Toronto area and helping them figure out how to become missional, how to evangelize, how to make disciples. And so pretty happy with what I was was doing, and um, I remember going into this uh, leadership meeting, about 10 people. So at the time, we're, we're doing conferences of like thousands of people, and I'm going to conferences in the U.S. and all of this, and for whatever reason, I get this invite, 10 people in this little meeting. I'm like, I guess so. Let's, let's do it. You know, it's going to take a couple of hours, and so I'm there, and this person's teaching on leadership, and then they say, can I pray for you? And this person begins to pray for me, and they say to me, um, the Lord says you are pouring new wine into old wineskins, so, because we're trying to do new strategies for evangelism and missions uh, in legacy churches, churches that are 30, 40, 50 years old. Uh, but the Lord says, I'm going to give you a new wineskin, and I'm going to raise up people in this province, in Ontario, and I will speak to a person in the province of British Columbia. He will come and make a covenant with you. And when he does, here's what's going to happen in your ministry. Guys, I'd never been to BC. I know it's beautiful BC, but I'd never been to BC. I didn't have a number, a 604 number in my contact list. I'm like, God, what are you talking about? I mean, I was, guys, I was so blind to the plan of God on my life and for my life. I wouldn't be, I was blind to this moment. Three years ago, if you asked me, Fanu, in 2022, what do you think you're going to be doing? I said, well, we'll probably be doing more consulting in Toronto, and we're probably going to do some international trips, and that was all I knew, and yet, God had a plan. We prayed about it a couple of weeks. No call from BC. Prayed about it for a month. No 604 number on my caller ID. Eventually, forgot about it. Like, hey, this is not going to happen. Months went by, and one day, my first meeting with Mark, and we're in a conference together in the morning. We were having lunch, and I just wanted to pick his brain on some stuff, and 30 seconds into the meeting, you know, guys know how Mark is, right? He's just right to the point. He's super direct. 30 minutes in, he's like, Fanu, uh, let me just cut to the chase. This morning at the conference, I believe God spoke to me, and he's, he wants me to invite you to join the team at Village Church. And, oh, wait, 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 before you get excited, I was still blind. I said, what? I started this thing at 18. What are you talking about? I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm traveling the world. No way, bro. I said, thank you, but no thanks. And it took a lot of praying and a lot of discernment, and then it clicked. Hold on, the guy from BC, maybe he's the one. He was the one. Listen, when I said Mark, the, uh, the recording of that prophetic word, he was just blown away because he had no clue. I had no clue. But guess what? Jesus saw that I was going to be here. Jesus sees where you're going. Jesus sees your tomorrow. This is why I invite people that don't follow Jesus to follow Jesus because the Bible talks about him as the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. He knows everything about your life, and it's not about what happens tomorrow. It's about, do you know the one who holds your tomorrows? What's interesting about this, obviously, is the fact that this man is blind. And in in the Bible, uh, blindness is often uh, related to spiritual blindness. And it's interesting, in the Old Testament, there were zero healings of blind people. And yet, in the ministry of Jesus, in the Gospels, it's the number one miracle Jesus does. I wonder if it's because it spoke to this is why Jesus came. He came to open the eyes of the spiritually blind. Hence the reason in verse 5 Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The light of the world wants to open the eyes of those who are sitting in darkness. And this is really what makes the gospel message so powerful. It's that 
Jesus is the one that initiates the relationship. The blind cannot start a relationship because the blind don't even know you're there. So God has to start the relationship. God initiates the relationship. Why is the gospel good news? It's because you don't have to be the one that tries to find God. God in Jesus came into the world looking for you. That's why the Bible says in Jesus, says, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. We're the ones who were blind. We're the ones who were dead. We're the ones who didn't have the truth. We're the ones who didn't see Christ. But he saw us and he came to us in compassion, in grace, wanting to give a spiritual sight. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not, guys, it's not our doing. It is a gift of God. You don't have anything to do when you receive a gift. You just receive it. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And here, this is why we're all in the same playing field, right? You could be, have been a Christian for 20 years. You're in church, you're tithing, you're serving, you're doing all this great stuff. And maybe you're also another person here that's a skeptic, doesn't believe in Jesus. Guess what? I have nothing to boast being a believer in Jesus for all these years. You know why? Because it was never me in the first place. It was never my works. I can't boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When I talk about blindness and spiritual blindness, I often share the story of a really dear friend of mine. Um, him and his family, they were going through a very difficult time in the Toronto area, and um, their, uh, his parents, their marriage was really a difficult marriage. Uh, lots of abuse, lots of domestic abuse, violence in the family. And his mom was so at the end of her rope. She didn't know what to do. Three children, he's got an older brother, younger sister. The kids in their teenage years are going crazy because the, you know, their parents are not really engaged with the children because of their marital issues. And so because she doesn't know what to do and she's not a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, but she is spiritual, right? So she calls up this number that she finds, an ad on finding an astrologer. So she calls up this number to talk to an astrologer, and the reason she wants to talk to the astrologer is to figure out her future. What is going to be the future of my children? So she dials this 416 number, right, Toronto number, and guys, would you believe it? That number had been switched from that of an astrologer to a Christ follower, a woman who followed Jesus. Oh, this is going to get good. Okay, watch this. She, she calls her. She dials the number. She calls her. And the lady answers the phone and says, you know, is this is an astrologer. And she says, no, it's not an astrologer. But she says, I know someone that knows your future. I know someone that holds your future. I know someone that can transform your life. And this woman's like, she's, his mom is like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. And they get up into this conversation random strangers, build a friendship, invites her over for coffee, invites her to church. Guess what? She gives her life to Jesus. She gets baptized. Wait, wait, hold on. It gets better. Guess what? Her children give their life to Jesus, and they get baptized. Now they become evangelists to their extended family who are all non-Christians. They give their life to Jesus. They get baptized. My friend ends up becoming an evangelist, starting a, a campus ministry in five or six universities in the Toronto area, leading, I don't even know, countless young men and women to Jesus. And now, the other day, I just saw on, their, on his Facebook, his son is now being baptized generational change not because she was looking for Jesus guys she was going the opposite direction she was blind but Jesus saw her Jesus saw her condition Jesus saw her predicament and said I'm gonna come find you you're gonna call a number I'm gonna transfer that number to someone who follows me who listens to me and she's going to engage with you and you're going to know my love for you isn't that incredible isn't that how God works though that Jesus is He's, he stops for the blind. He stops for the weak. He stops for the helpless. I guess the question remains, if we're Christ followers, who do we stop for? What catches our attention? I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, it's not your hold on Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It's not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not even your faith in Christ, though that be an instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit. It's all about Jesus. In my previous ministry context, when I would consult with churches, I would talk to them about what we called a tool we use called missional lens. We didn't create the tool, we just used it to help people see how to look at the world. And when you look at the world, you have the option of looking at the world in three different ways. 
One is you can look at people as scenery. What does that mean? It means you, you see people. Okay, this is the first time I'm doing this on the screen, so excuse the handwriting. You, that's see people, but you don't, you don't know them. You see people, but you don't know them. So this is like, I don't know, the, 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 the guy at work or the gal at work, every day for whatever reason, you guys get to work at the same time and you're in the elevator together. They're not in your department. You never have to talk to them, so you just politely smile, but you never say a word. You know what I'm talking about? Like people at the grocery store, maybe employees at the grocery store, you see them every time at the checkout, but you don't really interact with them. You don't have a conversation with them. You can also look at people as machinery. What does that mean? That means you know them. So in this case, you know this person. So this could be your mechanic. This could be your mailman. This could be uh, Sandy at HR at work. Or this could be Jim and IT. It could be Carol who serves you coffee at Starbucks. Like you know them. You, it's, it's awkward not to ask their name when they serve you every single day. So you at least ask them, what's your name? And you chit chat about the weather in Toronto. It's easy. I don't know about BC because uh, you have great weather. But we can talk about it's minus 15. It's snowing again. Like what is going on? And we talk about how bad the maple leaves are or something. Thing, right? We just come up with small talk, basically, right? But you don't really, this is the difference, you don't, you don't care for them. You don't care for them. You don't ask them deep questions because it doesn't really matter. They're just there to serve you. The other option is you look at people as ministry. What does that mean? Ministry means you look at people as image bearers of God. What if God put this person in my life for a reason? What if I see them in the elevator every morning because God has divinely given me an appointment to have a conversation with them? You know, this week, uh, one of our staff team members in Toronto sent us a, vo a voice note, sent me a voice note about an interaction she had with a dental hygienist. First time meeting this dental hygienist, she goes in, she went in an appointment, she had, an, she had a mix-up of appointments and a new person uh, was working uh, on her, a dental hygienist, and she starts talking to this person. She just feels this sense that, man, I should, I should really try to talk to her, get to know her, open-ended questions. They start talking. All of a sudden, this woman, she opens up her entire life story with, with her, like literally tells her everything that's going on in her life. And uh, Pastor Leah, she's a family ministry pastor, she says, can I pray for you? And she begins to pray for her right there, sitting in the dentist's chair. When she opens her eyes, this dental hygienist, she's got a mask on, but tears are rolling down her cheeks. Here's what she says. Almost a quote. I'm sort of paraphrasing. Here's what she says. Thank you. That is the most compassionate thing anyone has ever offered to do for me, to pray for me. Can you imagine? There are people that no one has ever prayed for them, and you may be the first one. But if you can see them as ministry. Verse 2. Jesus says this, and his disciples asked him, look at this, Rabbi, who sinned? Who sinned that this man or his, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Uh, the disciples bring up something that I think is a, a universal issue, a universal situation, which is, hey, why, does why do bad things happen? Why is there evil in the world? And often what happens is the worldview of, I would say, 1.7 billion people in the world is something called karma. Right? The idea that you do good works and you get good things. You do bad works and you get bad things. Right? My parents are originally from India. And uh, you know, I, it, there we have over a billion people that believe in karma. My grandfather, if you watch the uh, sermon I did the first Sunday of this, uh, of this year, uh, just for the online church, I talked about my grandfather who was a Brahmin Hindu. And he, he believed in that. And he came to know Jesus. Oh, I got to take a side tangent here to talk about this for a sec. My grandfather came to know Jesus, not because he was looking for him, because he had a vision of Jesus where Jesus appeared to him, called him, asked him to follow him, and he completely transformed his life. My grandfather was literally disowned and disinherited by his family. Disowned and disinherited by his family because of his faith in Jesus. Here's my point. The reason he did that, the reason my grandfather came to know Jesus, because he was tired of living by works. The other day, just here in Surrey, I was at a barbershop, and um, this guy, young guy, barber, he's cutting my hair, and we start talking about faith and religion and all of this stuff. And I asked him, I said, what do you believe about Jesus or faith and religion and all of this? And she, he says to me, I believe in the universe. He says, I believe that if you do good things, the universe gives you good things. If you do bad things, the universe gives you bad things. I said, bro, that is a tough way to live your life because the burden is all on you. You have to figure it out on your own. 
And he says, yeah, that's true. But he says, I'm just trying to do more good things than bad things. I said, the problem is when it comes to God, God is perfect. The test, the, the, the passing grade for God's test isn't 50 out of 100. It is 100 out of 100 because God is perfect. So I said to him, you may get 85 out of 100 in the test, and I may only get 65. And you may say to me, man, I am such a better human being than you are. True. But you know the problem is? We both failed the test. And if you're going to talk to people with this kind of worldview, you need to be equipped to think about how do I have these conversations. Here's how you have the conversations. I, I shared with this young man three things. Three words that I want us to remember. Number one, I talked to him about the idea of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It's unmerited love. He, was, he believed in works. He was talking about, hey, I got to do good things. I got I to keep performing. That is so tiresome to keep having to try to do things to please God for salvation. We don't want works. We want grace. Then I talked to him about Father. Why? Because he was talking about the universe. I mean, there is no relationship here. There is no emotion here. It's just about, you know, the ledger. If it's like bad things, if you owe a debt, you better pay up. The universe doesn't care. He's going to come after you. It is going to come after you. But I said to him, I said, bro, I said, what makes the gospel so amazing is that we have a father in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven. I said to him, Jesus Christ gave us the opportunity to be adopted into God's family. Listen, I love my children. I have two daughters. Um, but I don't always have pleasant interactions with them because they're at that age where they're trying to figure out what the boundaries are, right? And so, so yes, of course, we get into, you know, spats, and I, I, I correct them, and I scold them, and all of this, but my goal every day, every um, night, is I want to make sure I bring them back into relationship. That is the beauty of the gospel. When you talk to people and they say karma, they say works, they say I hope God is out there and listens to me, you tell them I have a father who loves me, who loves me so much that he's willing to forgive all my sins because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. We don't want to live in fear. And lastly, I talked to him about resurrection. I said, man... You know, the Hindu culture, the Buddhism, the karma culture basically says you've got to be born maybe a thousand times till you become perfect. You don't even know what you're going to be born into or as the next life. And he was talking about all this stuff, and I said to him, I said, listen, the Bible promises resurrection. You don't have to live a hundred lives. You don't have to worry about, I wonder what I'm going to come back as in the next life. Because literally, you could be a cockroach in the next life based on how you live, right? Like it could be, you, don't, you just don't know. You could come back as anything. But the Bible says, no, no, you don't have to come back. You can have resurrection life in Jesus. You will die if you believe in Jesus. You will die, and then Jesus will raise you from the dead, and you will have eternal life with the Father in heaven forever and ever and ever. That is the hope of the gospel of Jesus. I love what J.I. Packer said about God as Father. He said, what is a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. A Christian is one who has God as father. That's what matters. Verse 4. We must work, Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Work the works. What is he talking about? The works of God. One commentator says, you can also read the original language this way, the kind of works which only God does. Guys, let me just say something to you, when you if you're a Christ follower. It is not enough to rely on your own ability. It's not about, well, at Village Church, we've got all these people on mission together. We can serve and we can give and we can be good Christians and we can rally around and be united and we can do great things for God. That's true. We ought to serve and we ought to give and we ought to show up to church. But there, are, there is such a thing as works that only God can do. This is why the people who saw this man being healed, they were shocked. If you keep reading the passage a few verses down, it's like their minds were blown. Like, what is happening right now? No one can do this. This isn't like, you know, I've got a little ache in my shoulder. Okay, lift your arm. And if you lift it up three times, you're healed. Boom, great. And some people are like, yeah, I don't know. That's like, you know, a little bit of like psychology involved, you know. You're really healed. You just think that you're healed. The guy never had eyes. He was born blind. There's no way you can replicate this stuff. This isn't psychology. It is the power of God. 
The question is this, do we believe in the works of God? Do we trust that it is God who is doing the work and not us? You know, when I think about the works of God and the works of the Father, I think of my daughter, Lauren. Oh, by the way, I should probably show you guys a picture of my family. That would be a good thing to do. There you go. That is my wife, Trisha. We married 10 years as of November 3rd, 2022. There you go. After Pastor Mark's mess up, I said, I got to remember the anniversary date. Okay. Um, this is our older daughter, Lauren. She is turning four in May. And this is Catherine. She turns two in, uh, in June, right? And so Lauren loves to go swimming. So every time we go to a hotel, every time we're on vacation, she's like, Daddy, I want to go to the pool. She always makes her mom pack her swimsuit and all this. So we get to the pool. The only problem is when we get to the swimming pool with Lauren swimming is Lauren doesn't know how to swim. So what Lauren expects her father to do is put his arms out in the pool, get in the pool, put your arms out, Daddy, and she will lay flat on my arms, you know, facing down, and, and she, says, she says, okay, Daddy, let's swim. <laughs> that means that's my cue to walk around the entire pool, entire circumference of the pool with my daughter. And what's also interesting about this is Lauren just doesn't lay and enjoy the float experience. Uh-uh. She thinks she's swimming. She has her hands and arms going crazy. Her, her feet are chopping in the water. I mean, this girl is working. She is working at her swim. And then she gets back to the hotel room, you know, comes back upstairs, and she says to my wife, I, I bring her up, you know, I, you know, wipe her, put a towel around her, all of this. And she walks into the room. She says, Mommy, I had a great swim. <laughs> Here's my point. She completely ignores me. She doesn't say, Daddy was, was great helping me. No, no. I had a great swim. I wonder if sometimes we do that with God. Right? We're, we're doing all this activity. But we forget there's everlasting arms holding you. When you usher, there's everlasting arms holding you. When you talk to a person in the barbershop about Jesus, there's everlasting arms holding you. When you give your tithes to the church and you invest in the gospel, there's everlasting arms that's holding you to, to allow you to make the wealth so you can give it to the church. Listen, friends, we've got to never forget with all the splashing we do as followers of Jesus, it isn't our work, it isn't our ability, it is the work of God, it is the hand of God, it is the power of God, it is God working through us. That's what matters. I love what Tim Keller says about God's power. Listen to this. He says, when Paul talks about God's power, he says in Ephesians 1, I pray that you would know the incomparably great power of God. Incomparably great. What, what's really neat about it is that the Greek, it says, Hooper ballo, megatos, dunamis. You can almost, you know, hear the English in it, right? It's hyperballistic, megatonic, dynamite of God. And, and, and Keller says this, a nuclear warhead is a thousandth of the power of a hurricane. Yet the Bible says the Lord sits enthroned over the hurricane. A hurricane is just a billionth of the power of just one eruption on the surface of the sun, which is just a small star. And the Bible says God scatters uh, the, the stars like sand. The power of the sun is just a millionth of that of a supernova. And the supernova is just one of the infinite number, the infinite number of points of power in the universe. So what is the power of God? Is it a million universes? No. Paul says he's beyond beyond. He's greater than great. Even as we sit here, we try to imagine this, and we haven't even come to the outskirts of his power. Jesus Christ says it doesn't matter how insufficient you are. The gospel is put whatever you have into my hands and my power will come through you like a freight train. Super abundantly more than you can imagine destroying the power of death at work in your life. Wow. That's the power of God. You know, I have a really personal story when it comes to God's power. And it's the story of my, my wife's mother, Trisha's mom, uh, an incredible woman of God. And yet, they grew up uh, in, a, in the Hindu faith, okay? And uh, they grew up worshiping idols in Guyana, in South America. And unfortunately, my mother-in-law, uh, from when she was in her 20s, she became addicted to alcohol. She was so addicted to alcohol, guys, that she left the country to try to find help and never returned for many, many years. Because it never got better, it got worse. Like my wife and her younger sister grew up with relatives most of their life until their mid to later teens. And eventually her mom came back, not any better, actually worse. My wife moves to the Caribbean island nation of Trinidad and Tobago to go to college. And then she gets a job and eventually invites her mom over to come and live with her, still suffering from the same condition. And my wife, at that point, had become a follower of Jesus. 
and her life had been transformed. And so they were out one day, I think, doing some, you know, evangelistic ministry on the street, giving out flyers and stuff, and obviously she took her mom with her. And while they were on this walk, my mother-in-law has a seizure and falls to the ground with a seizure because of the alcoholism. Trisha's pastor at the time kneels down right there on the street, and she, he prays for my mother-in-law. Guys, he prays for her, and from that moment on, like when this woman gets off the ground, the alcoholic spirit, that addiction that had held her bondage and prisoner for over a decade and destroyed her family because of it was gone in an instant. It was completely, it's been over, I think, 15 years now, and she has not struggled with alcoholism from that moment. Yes, she's had to be disciplined. She's had to have smart decisions she's made, all of that. But the power of that addictive addiction was completely gone from her. When I look at my mother and I said, I can't believe these stories because this is before I got married to my wife. I said, no way, you don't seem like the same person. But then I have to remind myself, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about, let's go back to Keller. I want to read this for you. We're talking about the hyperbolistic, megatonic dynamite of God. We're talking about the power of God that's incomparable. Of course he could heal addiction. Of course he could heal sickness. Of course he could open the eyes of the blind. That's why we believe in the gospel. We believe in a God that can do the supernatural. We believe in a God that can do the miraculous. And why does he want to do it for us? Because he loves us. I'm going to just read the... Next couple of verses here, quickly, and say, As long as I am in the world, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva. See, for people with control issues, mm -mm, this is not a good story. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. If you got control issues like me, I'm like, uh, I want to be healed, but I don't know about this methodology. Like, you know, come on, Jesus, can we do it another way? Hey, guys, listen, part of it is you got to trust him. Sometimes it's not the way you like it. Sometimes this is not what I planned. I didn't plan to be here talking to you. Listen, I grew up in Bahrain in the Middle East in an Indian family, okay? When I was growing up, I was the shyest kid in class. I was the kid that never talked, never asked a question because I couldn't talk. I was afraid to talk. And I had a funny accent. You know the Indian accent, right? I was joking with the guys. I was here early and I was, we were doing some rehearsals. And you know, when you walk out here at this stage, my first time, by the way, hopefully I did a good intro. Um, <laughs> You have to say, you have to say, welcome to Village Church. And I said, man, my old Indian self, up to grade 12, up to the age of 18, I would have said, welcome to Village Church. <laughs> Just doesn't work, does it? It doesn't have the same effect. I mean, we were always talking, my mom was always talking about, Fanu, clean the window. And I understood what she was talking about. We'd go to church and they'd say, victory belongs to Jesus. But sometimes he does it, he just does it a different way, guys. I was joking with Mark when he was introducing the preaching team. He, um, he said, Chris Demonier, Victor Maynard, Michael Chinchilla, and Fenu. And a lot of people message me and say, hey, does he not know your last name? I said, no, I think he's just is afraid to pronounce it out in public. <laughs> I agree, Fenu Ipe is probably a little bit of a ground mud saliva situation. Right? Half of you won't even remember the name. But here's the point. God can choose to use mud and saliva to do the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. God can use you from whatever background, whatever, whatever story you have, wherever you grew up, whatever your education level, whatever your accent, whatever country you came from. It doesn't matter if you give yourself into the hand of the Father. He can hold you up. He can do His works through your life. And that's what He does here. Look at this. Verse 7. Verse 7, this is the climax of the story. And he said to them, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Honestly, guys, that's all I care about. As long as the blind are, eyes are open, that's what matters. That's what matters. It's not about how I do it. It's not about how he does it. I don't know how God's going to get us to plant churches in every major city across Canada, Village Church, but I tell you what, he will do it because that's his promise to us. And as long as it happens, as long as the blind see, it doesn't matter how he goes about doing it. Let me close with this. Maybe you're in this room or you're watching at one of our locations or online. You're saying, Fanu, I, I would like to be healed. I would like to be healed physically. I would like to experience, yeah, the power of God. 
And friends, listen, sometimes you get healed instantly. And other times you get healed over a period of time. And sometimes, for reasons we don't know, God allows his power to be demonstrated in how you're able to endure suffering. So people look at you and say, no other person I know could endure this with the joy that you have. Tell me about who gives you this strength. And that's sometimes how he gets the glory. But it doesn't stop us from asking, praying, believing that he is able to do it. Maybe you're, you're going through some emotional challenges. Maybe it's depression. Maybe, you know, you're going through a time where you're like, I just don't have hope in my life. I don't know what the future holds for me. What, why don't we ask the Father? Why don't we ask in Jesus' name that he would remove the depression? He would remove the addiction like he did for my mother-in-law. It could happen in an instant. Why don't we just ask him and pray, believing that he would do it? And, and, and lastly, maybe, maybe you're in this place today and you're like, uh, you know, Finu, you're talking about spiritual blindness. And I feel, I feel that way. Like, like, I feel like the young guy you were talking to at the barbershop. And yeah, I, I actually don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. And I, I do feel like, man, all this guilt and shame and burden of all the stuff that's happened in my life and all the sins and stuff I've done, it just constantly weighs on me. You know, some of you, you're like, man, I see the pictures of all of my mistakes it displays like a reel in my head sometimes. And I get depressed because of that. I don't have eternal hope. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. What if, what if we could just pray today that God would open your eyes, that Jesus would come and transform your life? He could do it. I believe it. If you believe it with me, why don't we pray together? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your power, for your grace, for your love. That Lord, even when we don't see you, you see us. You come looking for us. You have plans for us in the future that we don't even know about. Lord, many of us in this moment didn't even think we would hear a message like this and it would do what it's doing in our hearts right now. Like some of us sense a burning in our hearts to respond to this word. And we didn't think we would experience that when we walked in. But it's happening because you already planned it. So Lord, I'm asking you today, would you bring healing into the physical bodies of people that are suffering with illness, with pain, just like you did it for this blind man, would you, would you heal some people instantaneously right now as we pray together in the name of Jesus? Would you bring gradual healing to others that you have decided that's how you're going to heal them? Would you do that right now? Maybe it's through medication. Maybe it's through the doctors finding out what the actual diagnosis is and not the stuff they've been told already. Would you do that? And, and others, Lord, would you give them the power to endure through this season of pain and suffering? But would you do your work? Would you do the miracle that only you can do? Lord, I pray for those who are going through emotional challenges. Would you, would you bring healing in their minds? Would you bring healing, Lord, in their emotions? Would you remove that depression, Lord? Would you break the power of that addiction, Lord? Some people right now, they're prisoners, Lord, to addictions that they would like to be free from, but they just don't know how. Lord, would you do your work right now, the works of God? And Father, finally, I pray for those who are saying, man, I, I feel spiritually blind. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. I, I do feel the burden of all of my sins. I feel it. Fino. I, I don't know what to do with it. Lord, would you allow your grace to be poured out on them right now? Lord, would you, would you call them to you in this moment? Lord, would you have them pray, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you paid the penalty of all of my sins on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead and now you, are, you want to have a relationship with me. And Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. Would you save me in this moment? Lord, thank you for those who are praying that prayer in this moment. And Lord, it's not the prayer that saves us. It's the faith in our hearts. So would you cause supernatural faith to rise up within them? Thank you for the work that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed with us today, especially the last prayer, to have your spiritual eyes open, would you uh, go to the prayer team at your location right now? Or maybe go to the lobby and there's a connect desk. Just tell them, I, I prayed that prayer with Fanu, and I'd just like more information. I'd like someone to walk with me. Or maybe you're saying, I didn't pray Fanu, but I'm really stirred. Like, I really want to know more. Just go up to the prayer team, go up to the connect desk and just say, I just want more information. I'm wondering if I can talk to someone. And we'd love to help you understand what it means to become a follower of Jesus. And if you're watching us online, just go to thisisvillachurch.com forward slash connect with us. And Pastor Zach and one of our online team would love to follow up with you. God bless you.